Good evening, everyone, and um, thank you all for coming out. I think this is the 10th in the Fireside Chats. Probably a lot of you have seen most of them, and they've all been unique experiences, and tonight's going to be another one. So tonight, um, for this Fireside Chat, my guest is Brian Patton. Um, most of you know Brian's name. A lot of you know Brian personally. And if you don't, you at least know his book, The Canadian Rockies Trail Guide, which has led hikers to their destinations since 1971. It's uh, sort of the gold standard for hiking guides in the Rockies. But there's a lot more to Brian than just the hiking guide. And tonight, we're going to find out uh, about this. Brian came to Canada in 1967 and immediately fell in love with Banff and the Bow Valley community. Um, during the 1970s, he was part of a sort of a, a rebirth or a bit of a renaissance here in the Bow Valley, literary rebirth and a historical rebirth, um, uh, interest in the old stories and the out of doors. Uh, and, and now, for 50 years, Brian has been uh, one of the key players in telling the story of the Rocky Mountains. So please welcome Brian to Banff. <laughs> so Brian, I'm going to ask you one little question and then we'll let you carry on. <laughs> Why Canada? Why did you choose yeah, Canada? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> well, just as a before I get into that, I, I thought every day that I come over here, and I come over here infrequently these days, uh, this is my hometown. And I, I see so many people that I've, I've known through the years here, and there's no other place in the world that I can go and walk down the street, back alleys preferably, and see people that I know. <laughs> so, yeah, Canada, I, I guess as, as a born and bred American, I, I had a, a, a strange access to this country. Uh, I was an only child that grew up in northern Ohio with a, to a work, in a working class family. My father uh, worked at the Hoover Vacuum Cleaner Company and my mother uh, focused her whole life on me. And uh, so, <laughs> and, uh, but we always had interest in Canada and we always did a lot of traveling uh, for a working class family Why we would get into the station wagon back there in the 1950s. And in my dad's two or three weeks off from the factory, we would race across the country to the national parks. And uh, one of those, a couple times we came up into Canada, around through North Bay and down through uh, Niagara Falls and places like that. But then one summer in 1958, I think probably when I was about 14 years old or thereabouts, and um, came to Banff. And it was all the, the usual Banff things in those days. Uh, we bought uh, a, a tin of uh, shortbread cookies at White's General Store, and uh, we uh, traveled up the road to the Icefields Parkway, which was then the Banff Jasper Highway. My father just about didn't make it to the Columbia Icefield because that was the year they were uh, relocating the road, and it was all dirt and pretty mushy from the big bend up to the Icefield, so he just about turned back in a couple of those places. We camped at Paradise, if any of you remember the old Paradise Campground, which was right next to Paradise Lodge, it, it became a picnic area later, but it was still a campground with about maybe a, a dozen uh, campsites then. And uh, so that was an introduction to Banff. And of course, we had to get a canoe and go out and take pictures on Lake Louise. I was just told by my publisher it costs $106 to rent a canoe to go out for a half an hour to get your selfie nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, and then I, I, so I went to university, I started out in Muskingum College in southern Ohio, and then decided I got into forestry at Washington State University, and then Utah State University, where I majored in forest recreation for a while. But those were turbulent times in the United States, and uh, again, I'd always had close connections with Canada, some of my best friends at Utah State were Canadians, which was the second largest group of foreign students at Utah State in those days. The leading uh, group of foreign students were from Iran. <laughs> 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 so 
I, I didn't fall in with too many of them, but the Canadians uh, were good friends. And, uh, and then a Glacier Park was the beginning of my hiking career and my connection to what I consider the Canadian Rockies, which Glacier Park is really the southern tip of them. Uh, when I was 18 years old, I took the train across the United States and got a, as a, uh, a job at a motor inn in Glacier National Park. And our recreation for all the kids at the Motor Inn was to hike and climb and scramble and do all the things you do. And one day off, of course. Oh, and you also had to hitchhike. Like we all, we all had to hitchhike up to Waterton at least twice a year, twice a summer, and also get up to Banff once. And um, so that was where my hiking career began. And uh, it, uh, I, I like to say that my first backpack, and I, I mean, we backpacked light in those days. Forget about these guys who say they're trying to backpack light today. We backpacked from uh, Logan Pass to Waterton on the Highline Trail that goes up through Glacier there and comes down at the southern end of Upper Waterton Lake. And I have a photograph, actually, of my partner on that hike. We had a Coleman flannel-lined sleeping bags <laughs> wrapped in rubberized poncho <laughs> with two pack straps to serve as straps on our back. Oh, and yet a couple sandwiches stuffed inside. <laughs> and that's how we packed to, uh, to Waterton in those days. And uh, the, the next, so in the middle of the night where we were camped, something large stepped over me in the night. I remember that quite clearly. And the next day, about a half an hour into our hike, we were bluff charged by a grizzly bear. So it was a pretty exciting hike. <laughs> But again, this is one of the, my great first connections uh, with uh, the Canadian Rockies. When I was at Utah State then, I, uh, I had kind of an epiphany. When I, I came up to Eureka, Montana, most of you know where that is, and that again is just a storm that's drove from the Canadian border. And uh, I, um, I was working as, it, before the U.S. Forest Service because as a forestry student, I always had jobs anywhere in the United States that I wanted them and but I wanted to be close to Glacier Park again and um, th that was when I had the, sort of this feeling that I was in the wrong business because I was looking at the uh, the chief park ranger th or uh, forest ranger there and his assistant and I heard that during the winter they had exchanged wives and I decided this was not <laughs> 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 this was not a future that I really wanted. <laughs> and I got back to, to uh, Logan, Utah, and I also started to feel that the United States was not a place I wanted to live. I didn't really have a lot in common with these people. It wasn't just the Vietnam War or anything like that. I, I wouldn't even go that far. It was more a case of uh, just, you were living in, a, in an empire. Uh, and uh, in, unless you wanted to be part of that empire, and you just, there wasn't a place that you could live. And when you were so used to Canada and, and you knew Canada so well, you knew that there was san sanity was just a step across the border. So um, I, I became infatuated with Banff. I wanted to be in the Canadian Rockies. So I, uh, I did all things Canada for the next two years at university. I uh, subscribed to the Banff Crag and Canyon for two years. I... Uh, <laughs> I had all of Ian and Sylvia's records. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, they were, they were big in those days. And <laughs> I, had, uh, I read Mordecai Richler and Farley Mowat, and little did I know that someday I'd be feeding Farley Mowat uh, rum and cokes at the Book and Art Den. But anyway. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and you listen to CBC Radio. And CBC Radio. That was even probably stranger because... I don't know if any of you have ever listened to the radio up here. One of the few stations that you can get far distant from Banff is KSL in Salt Lake City, Utah. Well, in the opposite direction, one of the few things you can get in Canada is CBC Radio in Calgary. And so every night I went to sleep listening to CBC Radio in my, my room at Utah State University. So... Uh, and then I decided, okay, I'm going to work in Banff, even though I, it would, I knew it was going to be illegal. I applied for jobs up here, and I, and I had four jobs in Banff in 1966, coming into the summer of 66, uh, driving the truck at the Pearl Laundry, uh, pumping gas at Norquay uh, Esso, which was downtown here when we still had a gas station downtown, 
Uh, oh, lift operator at Mount Norquay. That would have been a, a hoot. <laughs> but at any rate, I jumped in my car when uh, school left out that, uh, let out that spring, and I headed north. But on my way, I thought, I'll just stop into Glacier Park and see uh, what uh, might be available in jobs. I always thought I wanted to work trail crew in Glacier Park, and it would have been a better paying job than lift operator at Norquay. And uh, as it turned out, the head ranger for the east half of Glacier Park had just had a uh, cancellation on his highway patrol park ranger for the summer, and so he hired me on the spot as a park park ranger on the going to the Sun Highway. So for the next two summers, that's essentially what I did. And again, I was still focused on coming to Canada, but of course, with a little bit more money in my pocket. But after I graduated in uh, 1967, my parents were a little reluctant to see me come to Canada because uh, as long as I was doing anything useful, I wouldn't have been drafted. And my father said, well, you should get a job as a school teacher. And I went down to Columbia Falls, Montana, and I did. I got a position as an English teacher there. But I still didn't want to do that. I wanted to come to Canada, and I, I knew that that would probably anoint me as a draft dodger if I did come without uh, jumping through the proper hoops. But I was really kind of uh, up in the air during that summer until one night when you all have these moments or spots in time you know that we all think probably affect our lives uh we the, our lives may not be preordained but these spots in time always seem to turn us in a certain direction and a lady broke her hip in a campground late at night when i was on patrol <clears throat> in fact i was the last person on patrol that night and so i went up and picked her up the chief park ranger came to meet me and he said, well, I'd prefer if you took her to the hospital in Cardston rather than to the native hospital in Browning, Montana. So he gave me the key to what we thought was the gate to the international border at Carway. <laughs> 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 and uh, this poor lady from Minnesota and her son, I can remember, stuffed into the back of my station wagon. And of course, because she had broken her hip, every little bounce drove her crazy and so I was driving at about you know a very slow pace to get to the border get there about midnight and the key doesn't work in the lock and so we're out there in the middle of the prairie in the dark I go to a, the convenience store next door and he sets the dogs on me because <laughs> they were used to uh, various people in various inebriated states trying to get across the border and then I found an old friend of mine who was the seasonal immigration officer for Canada over at, uh, he lived there for the summer and he let me across the border and he said, I'll wait up for you and let you back across. And I go to the Cardston Hospital. They had an emergency at the Cardston Hospital with a baby and so the lady and her son are stuffed into the back of my station wagon and um, finally I managed to get them out of the vehicle and into the hospital, and I go back. The sun is coming up over the, the prairies at that point, and uh, Derek is there with his immigration <laughs> hat and his immigration slicker and his, uh, his pajamas sticking out the bottom. <laughs> 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 and he lets me back across, and all of a sudden a car comes wheeling up, and it's executives from Glacier Park Incorporated, who I had worked for when I was 18 years old, and... Uh, he said, oh, we got to get through. We, had, we were late, had a big party. They were half cut, you know, and we got to get back to East Glacier, Montana. And Derek says, well, no, I, I can't let you back in. But you're letting him back in. <laughs> well, that was an emergency. And they said, but, 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 that's our country over there. <laughs> <laughs> and Derek just went, click. <laughs> but it's not mine. <laughs> 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 and... The only thing I can remember going through my mind at that moment was, and it's not mine either. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So uh, a, a week later, I was having a beer with Derek at the St. Mary Lodge, and he, I said, why don't you just go ahead and process my immigration? Cause, uh, and then I got a job on the ski patrol at Lake Louise. Yeah, so that's yeah. Um, October 31st, 1967. You Halloween the night in a snowstorm coming to Banff. Yeah, it's a quick experience. You came yeah. to Banff, and... Canada's 100th birthday that year it yeah. was a big year for Canada. Well, yeah, I uh, I don't uh, 
we talked about the the couple that when I was 18 years old, you know, I think I mentioned that couple yeah. uh, that I drove with. We that was when I was 18 and had that first job, and the three of us had hitchhiked down to uh, East Glacier, Montana, and we were on the way back. A Canadian couple picked us up, and uh, that was the year that uh, there had just been an election called between John Diefenbaker and Lester Pearson, and the conservative liberals, and uh, my. Two buddies just immediately fell asleep. These two people might as well have been speaking Greek. But I knew Lester Pearson, and I knew some stuff about Canada. And I, I listened to the husband, I'm going to vote for John Diefenbaker. And then I heard the wife, I'm going to vote for Lester Pearson. <laughs> <laughs> and I was kind of cheering for the wife, you know, because I knew of Lester and his work with the uh, Nobel Prize and things like that and, and uh, United Nations. And, so here I was, uh, five years later, driving that same road in the night, uh, going towards Banff, and uh, and now Lester Pearson was prime minister. <laughs> he was, he was, yeah. And Canada was was um, in a very happy mood at that yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So your first job in when you came to Banff was on ski patrol at Lake Louise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that lasted just for a little while. And uh, actually, the uh, yeah, I uh, I didn't work through the full uh, winter there. I was assistant patrol leader, not because I could ski, which I couldn't. <laughs> it's my first aid experience. But uh, and then we um, we took off uh, in the spring because the World Cup was being held in Rossland, and and uh, and Nancy Green was coming home to be awarded her World Cup, and. Uh, and I still remember sitting in, in trail in a bar with the American ski team. They ended up sitting us with the American ski team. And Jean-Claude Keely flew in by helicopter, if anybody remembers what a star he was, and came to the table and was shaking hands all around. And then he, these two guys at the end, he couldn't figure out who the heck we were. <laughs> <laughs> but then I came back and volunteered for the rest of the winter for, uh, and, and slept in the patrol huts on the Lake Louise Mountain uh, right. for the rest of the winter. Right, and then off to Banff, yeah. <laughs> off to Banff, and of course, and of course, this takes us into almost your first real job in Banff, yeah, and which was at the Book and Art Den. Can you explain what the Book and Art Den was? It was the, the history of it. It was the cultural center of Banff in those days. Of course, the, the Book and Art Den had been started by Peter Steiner and his wife Barbara, and uh, they had started it down in the basement of the Mount Royal Hotel, and uh, they. Uh, of course, then the Mount Royal burned down, and they managed to save a lot of the books out of the Mount Royal fire. And then they moved down to McKay and Dippy's Fine Furs. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, the old false front building that was down on Banff Avenue where the Clock Tower Mall is today. And uh, that had actually been used by Byron Harmon. It was a, a skylight in the back that Byron Harmon had used when he was uh, developing photographs and things like that at one time. And McKay and Dippy Fine Furs went back to the turn of the century. And uh, just as an aside, there was a back door on the Book and Art Den that had all the first snowfalls in Banff going back to 1909. <laughs> and wow. And then, so we kept that up during our years at the Book and Art Den. But yeah, I was hired on there and uh, soon became the manager for, I got hired on for a dollar an hour. And then when I became manager, it was a dollar twenty-five an hour. <laughs> <laughs> but but Peter Peter and Barbara, of course, were good friends and 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 kind of stalwarts of the community at that time. Peter had a good job up at the top of uh, managing the restaurant and at the top of Sulphur Mountain. His dad, as many of you remember, was the manager of the Sulphur Mountain gondola lift. So he had lots of time in the winter to think about other things that he could get involved with, and. Uh, so that's how the book and art end came. But it, the story was that Ellen, he, he was always trying to impress Eleanor Luxton and, and, and being just sort of a working class boy from uh, from the coast, why uh, he wanted to impress Eleanor Luxton. So the story, as the story goes, that's why we started the book and art den was to try to impress Eleanor Luxton. <laughs> <laughs> Eleanor Luxton was uh, an old time Bath. She was the yeah. English teacher. Well, the school, yeah, and, the, and the daughter of Norman Luxton, and, the daughter, and uh, yeah. of course you know the Luxton uh, Foundation now. Is yeah. Great, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, so, uh, yeah, and then, um, but uh, there was an elderly gentleman there whose health failed during that summer, and then I became the manager, like I said, for a buck and a quarter. And uh, then this this fellow came back, who was from Banff originally, and came into the store one day and said uh, he was interested in getting a job. And I said, well, you know, jobs at the bookstore don't just don't grow on trees. 
<laughs> but that turned out to be John White, and I didn't realize his, his qualifications certainly exceeded my own. So John and I ran the Book and Art Den then for the, the rest of that summer. And the uh, following summer, I was working there too. And uh, as I said, in those days, why, if you entered the Book and Art Den, and many of you did, I, or a few of you may have, you were met by a cloud of cigarette smoke <coughs> and a certain amount of verbal abuse, <laughs> especially if you weren't reading the, the right books. <laughs> yeah, yeah you, you told me about some of the interesting people that came in that you sold books to over the years. Oh, yeah, there were just all kinds. Like I said, Farley Mowat was there uh, signing his books one time, and uh, <clears throat> people would come in with paperback editions of uh, Never Cry Wolf, and Farley would just refuse to, to uh, sign them because, you know how much money I make off of these? <laughs> 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 and then I'd go in the back and get him another rum and coke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And Pierre Burton came to town. Pierre, because... Uh, uh, oh, Scott, Scott, the dentist uh, from Banff, uh, Scott, I uh, can't remember his last name now. Scott, Scott Marin, yeah, had a reputation of being the best dentist in Canada. We never quite figured that out. But <laughs> <laughs> Pierre Burton came in to, for that. <clears throat> Peter Law, he came in, went racing in one day to get Dalton Camp's latest book. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and he was sure that the two hippies, John White and myself, behind the... Uh, the counter were uh, obviously left-wingers who weren't carrying Dalton Camp's book, and we just had to tell him, no, it's coming, it's coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or the famous story, of course, that we were talking about earlier about uh, a gentleman comes in and he says, well, John, or he didn't know John, he said he was speaking to John, and he said, uh, I'm glad to see you, you're carrying my book. And uh, John sort of, and what book might that be? And he points to a dump bin of airport. <laughs> it's Arthur Haley, of course. And uh, John just sort of looked at him and said, well, we didn't really have much choice, did we? <laughs> <laughs> so that, that captures the atmosphere of the book. And the, the other thing you might have been greeted by was a locked door that said, back in five minutes. And that meant that John and I were having coffee at the Paris restaurant. And five minutes could have been any time, eh? <laughs> Forty minutes later, you're back waiting, and they're still having coffee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tell us about lunch with uh, John in the um, uh, holding court in uh, in the Paris. Well, the Paris was the place to be, and of course, anybody and everybody was in the Paris. You know, I that was our daily coffee break because you didn't want to get too far away from the bookstore, and. Um, yeah, anybody, uh, I, can, I was just telling Rhonda the other day about uh, the gal who wrote Where to Eat in Canada back in those days, and she was totally distressed when she got to Banff because as far as she was concerned, there was no place to eat in Banff. <laughs> <laughs> and it was a different time, you know, the restaurants were pretty mediocre in those days, and so we were always taking her over to the Paris and having coffee, and she was trying to figure out some place she could go to eat in Bath. <laughs> uh. Yeah, and uh, again, anybody and everybody, uh, Bruno Engler was always there as a, a fixture. Anybody who wasn't really fully employed. <laughs> so that meant bookstore staff or else uh, people that were freelancing. <laughs> yeah, and the Grizzly House started about that time. Yeah, I did, and in fact, that's what happened with me. I, I, I uh, hired on with uh, Jack Gorman and his Banff Summit News that was going head-to-head -head with the Craig and Canyon in those days. And as a result, I just sort of, the Book and Art Den could only justify one person uh, on staff during the winter. So uh, I left that up to John, and I went to the Grizzly House, and we served Coke and uh, pizzas. <laughs> <laughs> was, that was about all they, that we had. And uh, and that was a Peter Steiner business. And that was a Peter, too. Yeah, Peter was always involved in something. And uh, and so that was uh, that was how that started. So I worked there, and I also wrote for uh, I wrote for the uh, Summit News. And that was, and Jack Gorman was certainly a special person right. in this town for a brief t period of time. Right. And you had poetry nights, I think, didn't you? Oh, yeah. At, at the Grizzly House? Well, that was all there was to do in those days if you weren't drinking down in the Cascade. <laughs> <laughs> you were at the Grizzly House playing chess or bridge, or there would be poetry readings, and occasionally if somebody c could play the guitar or something like that, we had a classical guitar guy that was hanging around Banff for a while, and 
I, I think our old friend Rick Neville used to come up and sing a little bit of folk music occasionally. And yeah, so it was a real coffee house then before it graduated into a more of a serious restaurant. Right, right. And uh, so about that time, um, you got this idea to do a book on the hiking trails. Well, this gets us into our connection with my old buddy from Pincher Creek, uh, Jim Green, who uh, he and I were journalists down with the University of Newspaper at Utah State. And Jim had was also Jim Thorsell's only employee <laughs> on the first trail survey in Banff. Uh, Jim was uh, doing a, a survey of recreational use of trails in Banff and Yoho and had gotten government funding for that. And uh, Jim was his, uh, his uh, right-hand man and left-hand man, I guess. <laughs> and so at any rate, that was a connection right there. And I, I got to know Jim right off the bat when I came to Banff. And his report on the trails came out that, you know, recreational hiking is going to become a, more of a, an activity here. And we need a comprehensive trail guide one that tends to spread out the use rather than concentrating it on a couple dozen trails. And so that was where the idea of a trail guide came to be. And my then partner and I, uh, uh, Louise Mayer, we decided we would do a trail guide to Banff National Park. Yeah, it was just Banff Park. Just Banff National Park to begin with. And then this young lad floated into town named Bart Robinson. <laughs> And his fatal mistake was to come to me and said, Brian, would you like me to help you with the trail guide? <laughs> and only in recent years have I thought back to that, that fateful uh, comment that Bart was probably just intending that, well, yeah, I could easily go out and do five or six hikes and give you some information on Banff. But of course, Brian's eyes went back in his head and he went, Today, Banff, tomorrow the world. <laughs> <laughs> because the idea that you could ever do a trail guide to the other mountain parks, they just probably wouldn't justify individual books, at least in those days. So I immediately concocted the idea of the Canadian Rockies Trail Guide and that we would cover all the national parks, including Glacier and Mount Revelstoke. And uh, Bart bought into it. And so we launched into uh, planning for the, the Canadian Rockies Trail Guide. Most of that planning took place at the Banff Springs Hotel in the first winter it was open <laughs> because I hired on at security there and of course you were working swing shifts throughout the 24-hour uh, cycle. And when I was on the midnight to 8 a.m. shift, I would be on this old Underwood typewriter that went back to probably the first days of the CPR typing out letters to park superintendents and, and par chief park wardens saying, we're gonna do a trail guide can we get together with you on this week and blah, 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 blah. And so all the planning took place right then. And uh, like I say, it was a, a great place to do it because there was nothing going on at the Banff Springs Hotel the first winter it was open. So this is the winter of 69, 70? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. in fact, the, the, the hotel, it was interesting. I don't want to get into that very much, except that I had a lot of time on my hands to do this, this planning. But... Uh, their idea of winterizing in those days at the Banff Springs was just turn the heat up. And because people were dying up there on the, the eighth floor, which is as high as you could go, I think, and, or maybe the fourth floor. And I can still remember people with their drinks gathered at the fire doors, gasping for air. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually had a guy, because my, part of my job was to lock the fire doors at a certain hour every night, and he actually offered me $100 not to close that door. <laughs> and that was a lot of money in those days. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but anyway, that, and then Bart and I had, uh, the, one of the other things that happened when we, we started looking at the trails, and of course, Bart, uh, Jim Thorsell's uh, trail survey, he had a very good and thorough inventory of all the trails in the mountain parks. But we started to realize that particularly in Banff, they weren't measured very well. They were warden horse miles and things like that. And, and we were discovering that these trails were, the distances were way off on a lot of them. So we decided we had to get, build our own measuring devices. And uh, we went to see Bob Capel. And George is here tonight. His, his uh, father uh, was running a bicycle shop. And uh, 
he made us, we found some banana bars. You know, the kids had the banana bar bicycles then, and we took some banana bars and put them on a 27-inch wheel and put a mechanical odometer on it, and that's how we went out and measured the trails. And again, one of the features that we introduced into the trail guide that hasn't really been done too much since or before that was the mileage outline or distance outline where we, because we had those wheels, we could actually say, okay, you're going to encounter a bridge at uh, 1.3 miles. And then uh, people had an idea as they were hiking along how far they'd gone. Right. Nowadays, they don't need that. But <laughs> <laughs> well, they've all got their GPS. Yeah, so yeah. We, we worked like heck. And uh, like I said, we covered 103 trails that summer. I think what would I was I calculating 1,500 uh, kilometers or more? Yeah, about that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was very a quick, quick job, but we were in all the mountain parks. We'd come in on the weekends to recuperate and restock, and then we were back out again on uh, during the week to do as many, many hikes as we could. For Bart, it was more of an onerous thing because Louise and I had planned this. You know, Louise had had a good, useful job, and... Uh, had saved up some money, so we had planned out we had enough money to get us through the summer. But for Bart, he had to go back to the bar book and art den and work part time, and, and then find somebody to hike with him on the on the, the weekends or something. Or actually, not, he was hiking during the week too. We did a few hikes together, but mostly we were branching out and doing separate trails. Right. So uh, we hiked right up and into late October when the snow was flying to get as much done as possible. So you did all the research just in one season? For that particular uh, edition, yeah. I like to call the trail guide <clears throat> a 15-year uh, trail guide because there were a lot of things that we ended up covering after that that uh, came in the second edition and third edition. So it took about 15 years to, for, for me in my own mind anyway to cover most of the things that I wanted to get into the book. We had to drop Glacier and Revelstoke, of course, because first they weren't really in the Canadian Rockies, but secondly, we were getting so much information on other trails here in, in, uh, in the mountain parks here that I finally dropped them. One of the other interesting things that happened right about then, <coughs> excuse me, <clears throat> Jim Thorsell did his Great Divide Trail guide in 1970. And uh, the whole concept of a Great Divide Trail was born then and actually supported by parks, uh, the Parks Department at that point in time. So we published a uh, summarized version of the Great Divide Trail uh, in our appendix for the first edition of the Trail Guide uh, under Jim's... Uh, uh, byline, and it ran until two, the year 2000, which is the year that Dustin Lynx uh, brought out his Great Divide Trail book. Right. So uh, that was one of the interesting aspects of that early era. Of course, backpacking was very popular in the 70s, and it started to trail off a bit later, but but that was a, a, an essential item in the, in the trail guide in those early years. Yeah, and backpacking, there was, I think it really boomed in the early 70s. Yeah, it did. And Use it, of the outdoors, the baby boomers yeah, and, were coming of age. And that, fa and that fascination passed quickly as soon as most of you discovered so many people on the trails in the late 70s that you started looking for other places to go yeah. and places to get off of trails where, where it wasn't quite as busy. Of course, nowhere near what it is today, but yeah. uh, at least in the front country, uh, yeah. the back country is still fairly quiet. Yeah, yeah. And then... Uh, <clears throat> And then you teamed up with Peter and John again for, to publish the book. Yeah, well, that was Banff's first publisher. We're serious uh, book publisher. You know, Byron Harmon Photos had published some stuff, but mostly touristy uh, photo books and things. But uh, Bart and I didn't know who was going to publish it. We were just doing it. But then John and Peter stepped up and they formed Summer Thought and uh, said, you get the book done, we'll publish it. And it was uh, printed by Hignell Printing back in Toronto. And uh, the first, we were always late, or I was always late getting the, whatever I did completed. But uh, the book came in July of 1971. We had our first 40 copies shipped by air, and a dozen of them sold out at the Book and Art Den in one day. Catherine White, who had become a good friend by then through John White, uh, took a copy down uh, the next week to Waterton Park and gave it to Prime Minister Trudeau, <laughs> a signed copy of the trail guide. And yeah. so 
uh, it, it became a, a celebrity. Uh, I mean, you can't believe how many books we would sell. Uh, as you were, you were astounded, we printed 7,500 copies. Well, those were gone almost uh, immediately within the first year. And uh, sort of created a little bit of celebrity for us in the, in the region. Well, that's a big book run for mm -hmm. those of you who know publishing. Yeah. To print 7,500 copies of a local book is a big printing. And <clears throat> it worked. Yeah. You sold them. Bart and I used to go into Calgary to pick up. We published the book ourselves for a while in the late 70s and uh, with our two Volkswagen vans, and we'd get 8,000 copies of the trail guide thumped into them, and both of them <laughs> riding down on the Trans Canada Highway coming back. But before we would leave Calgary, we would get rid of two dozen cases of books easily just in the book outlets of Calgary before we even left town. So you, you t nobody ordered five copies of the book in those days. It was they ordered by the case, and uh, that was uh, part of the success. It, it, the book became, was sort of the only basic source of information on trails until probably the mid-'90s when Graham Pohl and people like that started coming out with books. Uh, the Daffrons were very early on our heels with their uh, covering of the Kananaskis country. And the Macquarie's out on the coast came out uh, a year or two later with their southwest uh, British Columbia trails. But the idea was it was a fairly new idea. It wasn't just describing the trails, but putting them into two-page formats with photographs and descriptions. And this was an idea that had sort of gotten started by the Mountaineers uh, a few years, a couple years before down in the Pacific Northwest. And so kind of copying that style but because it was a comprehensive guide and we had a lot of backpacking in it as well, the style didn't work quite as well as it did for the mountaineers, not quite as cleanly. Yeah, <clears throat> and you guys, uh, since you measured the trail so accurately, am I right in thinking that everybody's used your measurements since then? <laughs> uh, there were people, yeah, they've tried to do it surreptitiously in some cases or some kinds just blatantly because nobody was going to go out and push a bicycle wheel for the... Uh, I like to say that in that first 15 years of the trail guide, uh, I figured I, did I say, how many thousand kilometers did I say? 5,000, you 5, said 5,000 5, kilometers. 5,000 kilometers, and the three quarters of that would have been with a bicycle wheel in front of me. I can still remember coming out from a Cinnaboyne uh, once, and, and Bart had originally me measured a Cinnaboyne, uh, and that was back in the days when the park superintendent gave us the keys and I went up and picked up Bart uh, at the far end of the spray fire road. <laughs> Those were the days. And <laughs> it took my parents that fall after we had done Lake O'Hara. I took them up, uh, drove them up to Lake O'Hara because we just went and got the key at the field and drove up to Lake O'Hara. Anybody could do it. And we used to drive out the, the whole community drove out the Cascade Fire Road in the fall. That was a, a great fall drive for everybody in Banff. But <laughs> <laughs> another time. Another time, yeah. But at any rate, yeah, that, uh, um, that was sort of the... Yeah, 5,000 kilometers. Oh, yeah, and, and, and pushing that wheel for three quarters of them. Like I say, I, uh, it... Um, I still have the original trail wheel. I think Bart, Bart's trail wheel was stolen sometime when he was living up on Tunnel Mountain in one of the cabins there, so we had to make a new one for him, but uh, mine is the original one that Bob Cable created. Okay, you're <laughs> going you're gonna to bring it here and give it, it to the, it, it, the archive? I should. We had it hanging here when we did the 40th anniversary. Yeah, uh, and, uh, yeah. yeah. Wow. Well, thank you for doing that trail guide. Yeah. It's uh, helped a lot of us. <laughs> enjoy the mountains and then of course your life went on after the trail guide um mm -hmm. you lived in banff and had a very rich uh decade during the 70s uh you were talking about how esther fraser's book the canadian rockies influenced you so much yeah the combination of the trail guide and esther fraser's book uh bart and i didn't have a lot of background information for our trails that we were writing up so we did a lot of research at the White museum historical and natural history to fill in what you were seeing on the trails. And I was impressed that Esther Fraser had done this early exploration and I became fascinated with that era. And of course, John White, the point that we're sort of glossing over here is how much John White became a mentor and a partner throughout 25 years of his life and that we had together. 
And uh, so John was encouraging me to uh, explore these uh, the early the early period. He, John felt that there was more detail that could go into the early exploration of the Rockies. So John, Catherine, and Mary Alice Stewart wrote letters of support for me to get a grant, Canada Council grant, to go across Canada researching uh, the history of the early exploration period. And I, I traveled from McGill University, uh, uh, the Notman Archives, all the way to uh, the BC uh, Archives and uh, spent a couple weeks at the National Archives there researching a lot of this. Some of the hand transcribing, the, probably one of the first people to start hand transcribing uh, David Thompson's journals and a lot of the early fur trade journals then. So that gave me the background of the history that I used the rest of my life here. And, um, and it also uh, set me up to uh, teach at the Banff School of Fine Arts because John White always felt that the Banff School of Fine Arts or Banff Center as it became wasn't really doing enough to introduce students to where they were spending their summers. So he presented a course called Anatomy of the Canadian Rockies, and it would be taught by Jim Thorsell, myself, and him. And we would each use our own expertise to, uh, to do actually daily lectures to students who are usually in other disciplines, always in other disciplines, but usually in the ceramics and things like that. The people that were in performing arts, of course, were too busy usually to, uh, to go on hikes and go to an extra class every day. But we had a full bus, and every weekend on a Saturday, we would take people to everywhere from as far away as the Columbia Ice Fields, or we'd get the boat and go down the Lake Minnewanka and uh, hike up to Elmer Lookout. And uh, the only thing we were kind of weak on was our wildflowers. All three of us were kind of, uh, you know, I was a forestry geology. I had majored in that for a while and things like that. John White was the arts and environment to a certain extent. Uh, Jim uh, Thorsell was definitely uh, in, into environmental studies. and um, s But we didn't know our wildflowers from a bale of hay, so we brought Aileen Harmon along. <laughs> <laughs> and so Aileen was our flower girl. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Now that, that ran uh, 73 to 79, about? 77, that? yeah. 77. Yeah, five years, yeah. Five years. Yeah. And, uh, and David, then, David Layton? David Layton, and then he decided to have the introduce a school of the environment up there which had mixed success but uh, we were asked to uh, go up and advise on that and and then we all had other things to do so we the, the course sort of faded away yeah plus the, plus the students themselves just didn't they were getting so intense the curriculum up there that they just didn't have the time to break away to do this right, uh, right. other extra but, work but David Layton, he was the president of the BAMP Center at the time? Yeah, he was, yeah. Yeah, the, and uh, he supported this. That, yeah. That's very nice. And uh, it was a Ken Madsen. Ken Madsen was always kind of in, in charge of us up there. Yeah. Uh, he was working at the BAMP Center at that time. Wow, good. And you did a lot of things during those years in the 70s. You designed books. You were a broadcaster for CBC. You became a bit of a radio celebrity. Yeah, I was one of the first people to badmouth the tire tar sands on CBC. <laughs> I said, this is going to be disaster. <laughs> uh, yeah, they would allow me to do environmental stuff, history, whatever. Uh, we started out doing uh, um, book, book reviews, John and I, and we both had a professional style, you or your recorder, and we did reel-to-reel -reel recordings we'd send into the CBC. And... Uh, and so that that was how we got started. <clears throat> yeah, and uh, uh, what else? Oh, so you spent lots of time with John, but we haven't talked about Catherine. You spent lots of time with Catherine during those. Well, years. through John, I, Catherine was almost an immediate uh, p person that I became involved with because John and Catherine were inseparable. His aunt. And uh, Catherine was just loved anybody who was interested in the Rockies and the history and who was using her new archives, <laughs> which I did. we were using almost immediately. And uh, so, uh, yeah, we were often over at Catherine's house, and I can actually say we took some pretty good hikes with Catherine. Uh, Jim Thorsell actually, I think, went backpacking with Catherine, and even into her 70s, she was quite an active hiker. And uh, we... It was always somebody special on a, a hike you went with Catherine. I can still remember going up to Helen Lake and the ridge is just beyond Helen Lake there before you could drop down to Dolomite Pass. And she had the, sec the then Secretary of State uh, for, for the Trudeau government was with us that day. And 
Of course, John was along, and he immediately, as he would always like to name things, named that ridge Secretary of State Ridge. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a name I, that is held, I don't think. <laughs> no, 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 it uh, it hasn't. And and but Catherine loved to go on these trips, and she just loved to be. Uh, she was a real philanthropist, as we know, yeah. and uh, probably I I had one terrible embarrassing moment with Catherine. I was at the house one day and uh, uh, Catherine was so excited and, and she had just gotten this drawing of Tunnel Mountain, which was just a couple of pencil lines by Lauren Harris. And she handed it to me as if she was giving it to me. And I looked at them and I went, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's kind of nice. I guess it's Lauren Harris. And she suddenly realized that I thought she was giving it to me. And being Catherine, that meant she had to give it to me. <laughs> oh. and, at, and as soon as then it, it dawned on me that what was happening, she had actually purchased it probably at great expense for the collection. And I went, oh, no, Catherine, <laughs> you've got to keep this. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and, and, of course, now when Catherine died in 1979, you you took her place on the board. Yeah, I, I was named in her will to take her place. I think that was probably John's doing, but uh, she was probably asking who might do that. And uh, for a year, then John and I were on the board, and then uh, and it was at a crucial time too. It was uh, the White Museum just about sold the farm in that year. Uh, there was an idea of selling all the white properties downtown, uh, which we were financing the, the museum here, and. Um, I, I can't remember, I think it was Carol Harmon that came on the board then, and Carol was violently opposed, and that actually saved the day because the, those properties, I think, were essential to this this institution continuing the way it has. But then both and I, John and I, resigned our positions to go and work here. Right. I worked in the archives as an archivist for almost three years, and John became a curator of the, the collections here, and he he went on at considerable length after that. And you were identifying places in the Rockies. You were identifying photographs. That was my job. favorite thing to do, and that's what they gave me the job, because I had photographed so many things throughout the Rockies, and the, the photographs had always been important to me. I uh, I was really good at identifying photo, photos in collections, where people were and everything. I can still remember one of my first jobs was the Paris family collection, and uh, Cyril Paris became a real good friend then. And I can, it, it, you just, as you know, doing research yourself, Chick, you get into a collection like that and you become part of that family. And here was Cyril and his brothers and his father and early, the earliest skiers and skaters and such in, in the town. And going back into that period just before the uh, First World War and, uh, and during uh, the early days of skiing here that you really you started to feel like you were a member of the Paris family. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, it's a way to... Oops, oops. oops. There goes the ice axe. There goes the ice axe. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Um, before we carry on, how are we doing for time? Oh, we're, we're getting late there. It's already 10 minutes to late. 10 minutes to eight. Well, we've got another 20 minutes or so of stories of old timers. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All the people that you knew... Um, who would you like to start with? Anybody well, you know, that was one of the things, especially when I was writing for the Summit News, and again, I wanted to immerse myself immediately in the, in the history of the town, and I considered these people that were still alive then, like Jimmy Simpson and Edward Fuse, Foytz Jr., and all these people were like movie stars to me. But for a lot of them, I think they thought they were just sort of forgotten, and when a youngster came along and was so interested in them, they all, all of them sort of reacted very positively with me. And one of the first was, I, I think I mentioned, was Pat Brewster. And uh, I had just started with the Summit News. In fact, it was my first issue. And Pat comes with this big sheaf of papers that said, my brother just died in Jasper. I was wondering if you could write something about him. And that was Fred Brewster, of course, who was <laughs> the, the biggest Brewster name in Jasper. Fred was involved with everything up there. And of course, at the time, all I knew, Brewster, that's an important name and everything. Well, 
there's never been an obituary before or since that was as lavish as what I wrote for <laughs> Fred Brewster, complete with photographs, poems, <laughs> you name it. And uh, then Pat and I became bosom buddies for the rest of our life. John and I used to laugh about Pat. He was sort of, he was, uh, we called him Mr. Magoo because he couldn't see very well. You know? <laughs> and he used to bumble around town, but he was a great person to know. And again, uh, a great person to fill you in on the history. He'd built some trail himself on the way into Assiniboine. He told yeah. me how he built a high trail there to get out of the Golden Valley and stuff like that. And uh, uh, so he was a really, a really good friend for until his passing. Right. And a lot of those guys. Any who, who, Anybody else you want to... Jimmy Simpson, oh, Erling Oh, Stone. yeah. Well, Jimmy Simpson, again, I met during John White, you know, did a film on Jimmy soon after he came back to Banff. And Jimmy still had a couple of years in him. And so I went with John up and Catherine up to uh, Nantaja Lodge. And, of course, Jimmy was just a performer then, you know. Some person like me wouldn't have even known who we were. He was just too busy performing. But the most memorable moment, and it showed, it, to me, it depicted Jimmy's personality, was... Uh, it was when uh, Tenzing Norgay came to the old Alpine Clubhouse in the early 70s. They had a special event for him up on Sulphur Mountain. And Jimmy Simpson came down from Namtaja for that event. And uh, he was standing right in front of me. He was kind of short. And of course, he always had the flat brimmed hat on. And uh, we were trying to crane our necks to see Tenzing Norgay and, Norgay, and everybody was uh, sort of fussing about him. and. All of a sudden, Jimmy just turns around six inches from my face and said, well, the fellow's finally learning how to make a buck. <laughs> 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 so that, I guess that was probably more important to Jimmy than the, <laughs> the wilderness trips. <laughs> oh, gee. Oh, yeah, gee. Edward Foyts, we were talking about him earlier, too. And again, that was a special trip. You just came out of the blue with John and... Uh, and Catherine took me over to Golden, and Edward and his wife are still living there at the, in the Swiss village. And uh, again, little Edward. And I can still remember, you know, he again performing and holding forth. And all of a sudden, he grabs me by both arms. And if you can imagine this 90 year old man who's just sort of penetrating your arms, you know, and he said, You why? You know why no Swiss ever died in the Rockies? <laughs> and I went, No. <laughs> We stayed on the ridges and out of the gullies. <laughs> and I've used that as a general metaphor for life. <laughs> Stay on the ridges and out of the gullies. <laughs> oh, gee. Oh, gee. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. Th those are great. And you've got some more. We've got a whole bunch of names here. Oh, Who would you like to do next? Well, Anybody? Lizzie Romo was a good friend. Uh, we always travel with her. Uh, my biggest memory of Lizzie is we'd go to the CMH parties that they have every year that Hans would have. And uh, we were always the first to leave. And Lizzie always needed to ride home because she didn't want to stay around either. <laughs> but Lizzie took us up to see Lawrence Grassy once in his little uh, cabin up there on the mine side. And I can still remember that night just being there with Lawrence going through the photographs, old black and white prints of all the climbs and things that he had done. And <laughs> it was a great moment because Lizzie, of course, was in her 70s then, and Lawrence was in his early 80s. And they were talking about some gal who was a wildlife biologist at the time, and she was in about 40 years old. And, and uh, Lizzie was talking like, well, that young gal that's doing the wildlife studies up in Jasper. Lawrence just looked at her and said, She's no spring chicken. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope when I get to be 80 years old, I can look at these 40-year-old gals and say, you're no spring chicken. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gee. Wow. Well, well, there's a... Who else a, do we have there? <laughs> oh, who else would you... Erling, tell me your Erling story. Oh, Erling, yeah. That was the summer after Bart had been to uh, Assiniboine, and we went in there. And, of course, Ken Jones was the ranger then, and Erling was running Erling Strom, this, uh, who had was a Cinnaboyne Lodge for quite quite a few years. And it was rainy, and I remember looking out of the tent and getting out, and of course, our bicycle wheel was there, and Erling comes riding up on his horse with his yellow flicker, and sort of had a bemused smile on his face and looked at this wheel and wondering what it was. And I said, oh, we were just measuring the distance in from uh, Sunshine. I said, it's 16 miles, and he just smiled, and he said, we always said it was 20. 
<laughs> and you could see it was always going to be 20 for Erling. <laughs> oh, Later geez. on, of course, Peter and I, Peter was publishing a summer thought and got picked up Erling's Pioneers on Skis, which is still one of the wonderful seminal books on early skiing in the, in the Rockies. It had been published originally by one of his clients down in New England, and that the book then came to summer thought. And uh, so I was one of the last people to person people to talk to Erling at we were in the old Mount Royal there and uh, not, not the old Mount Royal but the Mount Royal that has burned again <laughs> <laughs> and uh, making the deal on uh, our publishing and after that I would frequently call him in Norway and uh, he would always be answering the phone in Norwegian and, and and the operator would be trying to understand what was happening and I'd be yelling into the phone he can speak English <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, and uh, who else was it? Uh, well, uh, tell me about Mary Alice Stewart. Mary Alice Stewart was uh, um, Catherine mm -hmm. White's, uh, the, the woman that Catherine White hired to set up the archives in the museum here. Yeah. So Mary Alice really was the brains behind uh, the contents here. Yeah, her and Catherine had worked together for the years before 1968 when this opened. And again, when we were doing our early research, why uh, she was in charge, and again, uh, very much of a supporter. Like I said, she wrote a support letter for me and, uh, and was a good friend in those days. But then <clears throat> later on, we got involved with Mary Alice again. And again, I didn't realize what an important figure Mary Alice was. I didn't realize she was essentially a Brewster. Uh, you know, all I knew, she had married some guy and came back from Oklahoma. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, then later on, well, she sort of was involved with getting my partner Rhonda and I together uh, when we did the Banff Bow Valley study back in the mid-90s and was a good friend all through that period and, and told many stories about the early days of riding on horseback up to uh, the Icefields Chalet when it was being built and, and things like that and, and the people in her family that she knew and so was always a friend right up until our, her death. We always stopped to see Mary Alice at her house up on, uh, up on Mar right. Muskrat. Um, Billy Vroom? Billy Vroom was a mountain a warden, mount rescue warden? Uh, park warden. Some yeah. great stories. I actually used a, a Billy Vroom story in my Tales from the Canadian Rockies book, which was an anthology of writing. Because Billy was on one of the first uh, major rescues of Brian Greenwood on uh, Tower of Babel, I guess it was. Babel East uh, Face. Babel, oh, okay. The yeah. Mountaineer. <laughs> 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 and uh, with uh, Walter Perrin. And, uh, but Billy was the only warden that we encountered during that first year of, of trying to sell our idea of a trail guide. Uh, he was the main warden who was really excited about the trail guide. He had done his own kind of trail measurements and stuff. He knew that a lot of the measurements were off. He was also one of the best storytellers I've ever known. I think if you come out of southwestern Alberta like Billy did down at Beaver Mines, uh, you, you had to be a, a storyteller. And uh, so I had so many great moments with Billy. At the trail guide, like I said, he was invaluable during the, the creation of the trail guide because he was so enthusiastic. He had maps, he had everything, spent a lot of hours with us. And then over the years, the rest of his life, telling stories, and I still tell Billy Broom stories today. <laughs> and uh, one of my favorites was sitting in the Banff Cafe with Billy and Again, when I was working on one of the newspapers, like I edited the Crag and Canyon briefly and on the Summit News, Billy was a, would kind of clam up because he was afraid that things that he might say might end up being used in the newspaper, and he was working for the Park Service. And, but whenever I wasn't working, it was just hilarity <laughs> and, and all sorts of things. And one of my favorites, we were talking about bears once in the Banff Cafe, and we had been going on for half an hour over coffee there, and... Uh, and then all of a sudden, Billy just sort of fell silent for a while. And then he said, there's a lot of places in the park you can go and, and never run into bears. And then we both fell silent for a while. And then Billy said, like here in the Banff Cafe. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gee, well, that's great, great. We're, get, we're getting through this list. Uh, Lloyd. 
Tell us about our old friend Lloyd. Lloyd McKay. Of course, my partner Louise was working at, uh, as a legal secretary for him in, in those days. And of course, I would always get in at the end of the day, and Lloyd was this irrepressible lawyer out of Nova Scotia who was, happened to be the, probably the best climber we had in, in uh, the Rockies in those days. And uh, he would always have some sort of ridiculous story that he wanted to pass along. You know, you would think there was a lawyer privilege, but... <laughs> 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 but anyway, Lloyd, I could, again, spend a whole evening talking about Lloyd's stories, and if, if <laughs> Chick added his, well, we'd be here for a week. But uh, my favorite one was when the trail guide came out, we gave him a copy. And he, he and Tim Baker, I guess it was, we figured, were going up to climb on the rock wall in Kootenay Park. And so Lloyd thought this would be a great way to test the trail guide. He would take the trail guide along for their approach to the mountain. Well, they got lost and never got to the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> The trail guide failed miserably right off the top. <laughs> <laughs> Lloyd, Lloyd was a good friend of mine as well. And he, tragic story. He died 37 yeah. years old of cancer. Yeah. Real sad story. And Brian wrote uh, Lloyd's obituary, and it covered the front page and page two of the Craigan Canyon. The whole front page and the whole page two was Brian's obituary. Well, lavish obituaries have gone down the hill. In fact, it was kind of lucky that back when John died uh, in 19, uh, 1992, uh, Bob Warwick was editing the Craig and Canyon then, and Bob sort of was eventually fired by the Craig and Canyon, probably for allowing obituaries to cover more than one page. <laughs> but uh, I did a, some, we did some major stuff on John then, but since then, you know, a lot of local newspaper editors figure out, don't start writing obituaries because somebody else will get upset. And, so that, Too bad. that's why we had the lavish obituaries on, yeah. on important characters, though. I mean, there yeah. are some people you cannot pass over, you know. No, and, uh, no. So. no, I remember reading that when Jim Brewster died in 1947, <laughs> they shut down the schools for half a day yeah. here in Banff. You know, just a local business, well, a big time mm -hmm. local businessman. So <clears throat> anyways, uh, so I think we've gone through most of them now, except Bruno. Do you want to... Your old pal, Bruno. Well, do we want to talk about Aileen first? Or do, do you want to do Aileen? Okay. Oh, yeah, let's do Aileen. Because, okay. you know, Aileen Harmon just died a couple of years ago. Or maybe it's been longer than that. I don't know. <clears throat> At over 100 years of age. And when she died, all of a sudden I was wondering, why do I know so much about Aileen Harmon? Because we weren't bosom buddies. I mean, Aileen was better friends with Bart than she was with me. And... Uh, but I had all these stories. I knew where her grandmother was buried. I knew, I knew that she'd named the Weeping Wall up on the uh, Icefields Parkway. And uh, I suddenly realized it was when she was our flower girl during the hikes we took in the mid-70s with Thor and John and I. And you're on long bus rides, you're on long hikes, and you're just talking. And I picked up all this stuff from Elaine. And then Bart, of course, has spent more time he went out for the memorial for uh, Aileen when she passed away and talking to some of the old timers that knew her, kn knew uh, her their entire lives. What a life she must have led because she was working for the parks department in the 1930s when the Banff Jasper Highway was opened. And by that time she'd given up on the horses that her dad was getting her out on horseback rides when she was in the, in the 1920s. She was, had become a hiker very early on in her life. And that Banff Jasper Highway was just like a kid in a candy store for her. And she, she hiked and climbed everywhere. And, I, and I, I, I firmly believe that she applied most of the creative names that we see up there today. Carol Harmon, when I mentioned the fact that uh, she had told me that uh, she had named the Weeping Wall, Carol said, I think she named Snowbird Glacier as well. And also uh, the uh, Don Beers, of course, who's a well-known trail guide, guide writer, said, told me that he felt that she had named Rockbound Lake, that it had been called Horseshoe Lake before that, but that Aileen provided a more appropriate, colorful name. And one of the things Alien always told me was when we'd be bussing up to the ice fields, we'd go over Noceum Creek. And I often wondered about Noceum Creek. I thought, well, maybe some road builders had named it or something like that. But 
There are very few colorful names by anybody <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the Rockies. And uh, she says, no Sam Creek. That's a good one. She said, uh, you hike up there, and it's a, it's a great hike. And, uh, and then when she died, I finally got around to looking at a map. Oh, and the other thing she'd always tell me, and don't put it in your trail guide. <laughs> <laughs> and then I suddenly realized you had this short hike with a little bit of a head wall at the top and this great little lake up at the top in the Alpine. And she probably, I bet anything she named No Seam Creek because she was up there and these bugs were probably getting at her and she went, bugger. <laughs> <laughs> My other favorite, one more favorite alien story was the only other time I socialized with her was the annual bird count. And, and Heather Dempsey will probably remember some of these uh, events. But uh, Aileen had two comments during the bird count when everybody would be giving the birds they had seen at the end of the day. If it was a bird that she thought you hadn't really seen it, she'd say, that's ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> but if it was something like Hallie Flaguer and I came up and, and with our count of 400 and some ducks in, in Canmore, she would go, that's disgusting. <laughs> 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 so it's either ridiculous or disgusting. Anyway. <laughs> good, good. That's good. Uh, yeah, great to hear that story. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and then, I, I, oh, we've missed... We've done all of them except Cyril Paris. Oh, I think I mentioned Cyril, you, you and, ag and okay. again, uh, it was Cyril uh, was a good friend, especially with, through John White again, because Cyril was just an old sweetheart. He was still hiking with the Bow Valley Naturalists right up into his 70s. I can still remember he, he went up onto Cory Pass when he shouldn't have, when he was getting a little older and, and didn't really quite ever recover from Cory Pass <laughs> in his 70s. But uh, at any rate, yeah, Cyril asked John and I if we would spread his ashes on Deception Pass when he died. And uh, because Cyril named Deception Pass when they were in there building Skokie, why uh, Cyril always felt that was a deceiving, uh, a deceiving hike there because you always thought you were almost at the top of the pass and then you weren't. Uh, and then when Cyril did die, why Mary, his wife, decided she preferred it. He stayed on the mantle. <laughs> <laughs> And I imagine he's up with the rest of the family in the cemetery now. <laughs> oh, gee. Oh, gee. Wow. And, of course, your old pal, Bruno. Yeah. You were very close to Bruno. This, these are the parentheses of my life, the beginning and the end in Banff. <clears throat> Excuse me. Because uh, I was looking at Bruno pictures when I was down at Utah State uh, in the Kraken Canyon, and those... Well, that was the only reason to read the Crag and Canyon in those days. <laughs> it was Bruno's pictures. And that was the romance of Banff, was the pictures that Bruno was publishing in the Crag. And then when I got on Ski Patrol at Lake Louise, there was Bruno. And I was so happy to meet this celebrity. And all I can remember, of course, in those days, we all went to the Post Hotel for breakfast, all the lifties in the ski patrol, because Alpha Legace was running the post, and that was where everybody ate at the old counter in there. And uh, Bruno was on the front porch and going, did you hear that huge avalanche that went off of Temple last night? Half the glacier is gone. <laughs> <laughs> and then he would sort of stood and, the, the snow around here is shit. I'm going out to get her baldy. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, I got to know Bruno very well. I always thought, oh, I'd love to have a Bruno picture. Well, Bruno and I became best buddies and, uh, and later in life. And, and like Rhonda and I like to say, he had a bad period in his life between wives and family. And he, he actually spent Christmas and New Year's with us once when they had absolutely nobody else to go to. And... Uh, and we didn't either, I guess. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, Bruno, yeah, he was always... And then we left uh, Banff about two months after he died because it's, it just that wasn't planned, but it just seemed to be uh, the end of an era for us that Bruno had always been there. And, and again, my, my fascination with Hollywood movies, which uh, became a bad hobby... Uh, came through Bruno because he worked on so many of these Hollywood movies and uh, again supported by John of course who was always into these sorts of things right <clears throat> right and uh, yeah yeah Bruno uh, I'm trying to think of some of the other great stories well you had the story about uh, being an old fart oh <laughs> yeah that's a good ending for tonight 
Bruno and I were actually in here uh, going through the gallery one day. Uh, I can remember, what, he's one of the first, one of the only old people that I, I, I took to a movie. We went to see Last of the Mohicans, was, <laughs> which was filmed down where his, his last wife and his last children were in, in Carolina. But at any rate, I, I think it was around the time we went to that movie, we came in here and we were looking at the exhibit, and there was a picture of John Murray Gibbon. And if you remember, John Murray Gibbon on the trail rides was always kind of a portly guy with his hat. And uh, there was always a young cowgirl in one of these Dale Evans outfits <laughs> <laughs> that he was talking to. And Bruno sort of stared at it for a second. And he said, ah, John Murray Gibbon, he always liked the young girls, but he was nothing but an old coot. <laughs> 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 and then he sort of fell silent for a, a few seconds while he was looking at the picture and then kind of wistfully said, and now... I'm an old coot. <laughs> <laughs> and so I am, 25 years later, talking to Chick Scott. <laughs> yeah, you're up here on the podium of recognition. More coots. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just, uh, uh, just to finish it off, tell us about your new book. Um, well, on Hollywood, Hollywood and uh, the we're, Rockies. we're still struggling with it. We're doing it as an e-book to start with. But again, I've been playing with this ever since uh, I worked here at the as an archivist and started collecting information. And of course... So much new stuff has come about since the dawn of the internet uh, that uh, finally uh, Andrew Hempstead, who owns Summer Thought now, it uh, was saved by his purchasing it from uh, from the Steiners, and uh, he would like to do it as an ebook. And so we're just going to sort of go back through some of the stories. Uh, the book is going to list every theatrical film that was ever made here, which are over a hundred of them, and. Uh, but also tell some of the stories behind the uh, behind the scenes, and of course, from in the early years, from 1953 back to the first film that was filmed here in 1910, 1919, uh, people would wander onto the sets all the time. They, there was no such thing as a closed set in those days, and so uh, as a result, there were a lot of good stories from that period. But uh, we, we we're going we're gonna to try to get a complete list out, and then maybe we'll do a print edition someday. Oh, great. Good, yeah. good, good. Well, thank you very much, Brian. Well, thank That's you. That's fabulous. Yeah.